Touchdown Tampa Bay, you're listening to the PewterCast. Welcome to the PewterCast. This is our final thought show for the Buccaneers at the Falcons, and I am glad to put this game to bed but there's been a lot of stuff that's happened uh we've had our instant cast we had a very special edition come out yesterday of an instant cast with some news i'm sure we'll talk about it dive into it a little bit more later on today and here we are at our final thoughts my name is brent allen i will be your host for today's episode as i am you know for most episodes but i'm not here alone i am joined as always by my co-partner co-cohort co co i don't know Whatever he is, he's my co-host, Ren Daxt. Ren, what's going on, buddy? I am the uh, assistant regional manager. Assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I was hoping you got that. Uh, <laughs> that was not rehearsed. Yeah, you know, this Falcons game, I feel like it was the first football game the Bucks were in. You know what I mean? No, like, what do you mean? It was such a blowout of the Saints. Like, we were up 24 points at one point, you know? Okay. Uh, we had a big lead on the Eagles. The Steelers had a big lead on us. Chicago game was over by the se- halfway through the second quarter. This was Chicago game was over by the second series. It felt like. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it did, but you had to wait till he threw his fifth touchdown to sure. Uh, make make sure. <laughs> well, now it's really over. I just thought it was over. Right. Now I know it's over. Uh, so this was one where you know it, the the Falcons never got this huge lead. Mm -hmm. Or we didn't get this huge lead, you know, where it was always like every series really felt like it, you know, it counted and uh, ended up being a close game. And, you know, the Bucks had a chance to win. And and that was that one six to twenty one. You don't think that was a huge lead? What's that? Twenty one to six. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, But 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 then the Bucks went down and scored and made it 13 to 21. Fair enough. Yeah. You know, and then and then uh, I think they stopped them. And then, uh, you know, the Falcons keep the field goal right at, right at the end of the half. So, so the Bucks were in it. The Bucks were in it. Yeah, yeah. And then they got the ball and went down the field and scored. Yeah. And they were down, what, when Winston threw that interception off the ricochet, mm-hmm. that would have put him, that would have put him at what? I mean, I think it, it would have been, a, it would have been something like 22 to 26. Right, right. You know, and that would have been like, I like, you know, it just, they scored, then we scored. And then it was like, hey, it's a ball game. It just happened you know a quarter later sure uh, so yeah that's what i think about that but y- you know uh mike smith got fired and uh the defense is doing terrible and uh so we brought in a special guest to uh lay some facts down yeah it was one who so- uh he's been taking a little flack out there on the social medias here recently but it was it's it's fun to get him in nonetheless and, uh, you know, kind of get his perspective on things. Um, Ren, why don't you tell people who we got tonight? We have brought in, uh, rights for the Tampa Bay Times, uh, Tom Bassinger. Uh, you know him on Twitter as Tom Metrics or Tometrics. I'm never really sure how that goes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he does the metrics or the, Atlantic, or the analytical work for uh, the Tampa Bay Times regarding the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And, you know, when, when fans complain about the Buccaneers don't blitz enough. He breaks it down and goes, "Well, you know, they actually they blitz like like seventeen times. It just didn't work. Sixteen of them, uh, you know, things like that. Right. <laughs> how you know how bad actually is a red zone turnover? Like he, he'll, you yeah. know, he could, he'll figure that out. Like, well, teams that have two red zone turnovers in a game lose, you know, ninety two percent of the time. Yeah. So yeah, he's he, he sort of takes the hysteria and breaks it down for you. And he goes, "No, the, this is actually." you know league wide uh, what sort of happens sure yeah so we'll talk to him and we'll get his it, not just his thoughts on the whole mike smith situation but mostly on what should buck fans expect from here on out uh, at least through the rest of the season uh so looking forward to getting into that after that we uh ren and i will break off and we will do our own final thoughts anything that we didn't get to during the instant cast uh anything that maybe here just over the last couple of days of things have simmered a little bit rewatch the game a little bit uh you know boil down all our last thoughts here as we grade out this game and then in the second half of the episode we have a lot ren and i mean a lot 
of emails that people have been sending in really since last week, uh, which is which has just been crazy. You guys have been uh, awesome doing that, so we're looking forward to getting to all of your emails and questions in the second half of our final thoughts episode. But with no further delay, Ren, why don't we go ahead and get into it on today's episode of The PewterCast. Oh, I know I'm on the rise again. Some sights on where I'm going, and my goodbyes are where I've been. Oh, I know I'm going to rise again. Singing farewell, king of the broken. So long, my friend. We could always count. Uh, thanks for reaching out and uh, having me on. You guys, uh, Enjoy the show. It's taken on a more of a somber tone lately, but uh, enjoy the, the show and the work that you guys do. So thanks. Yeah, I had a hard time shaking that uh, Chicago loss, and then with Dirk Cutter's uh, excuse, or I mean answer on uh, Monday, I, I just couldn't. It took me. It took me two weeks to shake it. And I'm just like, you you're kidding me? I think it. I think it took the uh, the team a couple weeks to shake it. I think it took everyone a couple weeks to shake it. Uh, I mean uh, that. That that loss was was like a it, it felt like it torpedoed the season. Yeah, uh, for me, you know, the Chicago game was like a, the litmus test for the defense, and it couldn't have gone worse. You know, there was excuses for the Saints game and the Steelers game and the Eagles game about how they played, but you know, now they were facing an offense that you know, with the quarterback at the helm, had not been very good, and you know, just lit them up. So yeah, I was a uh, I was very upset for a couple of weeks. Yeah, and um uh, you know, I remember noting after the um after the Saints game when I when I did my my all 22 breakdown. Um I remember noting kind of kind of the second half of that that you know, the 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 defense as as good as the offense was, the 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 defense, the issues on defense during that game had to at least be uh concerning and that if and if this had were to continue, that we'd be heading toward a, a, a disaster. And mm-hmm. you know, people kind of kind of dismissed me, and they were like, "No, they they shut them out of the third quarter. They started playing prevent defense in the in the fourth. No, they're they're fine." Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I want to say, I want to say that the Bucks had never won a game in which before that one in which they had allowed 40 points. So it's, it's a, it's a hard thing to do to, to give up 40 points and, and, and win a football game. But you know, the, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, even, it's, it's easy to say now, right? But yeah. The signs were, the signs were there. And it's even harder to continually give up 40 points or 35 points or whatever they've been giving up all season and continue to expect yep. your offense to come in and bail you out. And, you know, Tom, I, I was, I was right there with you. Um, You know, I I said since game one, like if I'm the offense, I'm thinking that we have to be up two or three scores at all times because I I don't trust the defense to hang on to a lead if I hand it to them uh, at any point. And I will admit, after they kind of shut out the Steelers in that second half, I I think I was kind of starting to say, well, maybe, possibly. Um, But then once I saw that Chicago game, I I was done personally. I was was like, I, I can't trust this defense for anything. It just not in the iteration that it is right now. Yeah, and I, I understand that. Uh, you know, um, you know. I think that's 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 uh, that's part of the reason why. Um, no, I, I didn't expect the the defense to be as bad as it is, which which is on pace to be historically bad, worse than the, um, worse than the 1986 defense. If you guys remember that. Um, which which might be the all time worst defense, not just Bucks defense, the NFL's all time worst. Mm-hmm. Um, which for for that era they were giving up, um, I want to say, you know, six six yards of play, which for that for that era uh, was a lot. But they gave up, get this, thirty one rushing touchdowns that year. Oh my God, thirty one. Yeah, Jeez. so. So anyway, this this defense is is bad in in kind of the the opposite way uh, on on pass defense. 
Um, but you know, I think that was, uh, that, that was part of the reason why heading into this year. Now I expected the defense to be closer to league average with, uh, with the guys they brought in and, and the overhauled, um, uh, defensive yeah, line. But that, that's part of the reason why it was like pass early and often, you know, right. no more, uh, you know, we saw throughout the 2017 season, uh, the, the formula, the pattern, was that they'd fall behind early and then they'd play catch up and 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 ultimately would would fall short. So you know to to turn it around, the way to do that is not to establish the run. It's to pass, 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 pass. And we saw it work in the first two games, right? But right. then you go out to you know then then the Steelers jump on you. You you know you make you turn the ball over a couple of times early, and then you go out to Chicago. And, um, you know, I think they were just flat out out coached, uh, in, in Chicago. Um, I mean, not just out coached, but, but beaten really in every, in every phase of the game, you know, offense, defense, coaching, special teams, uh, that, that was, uh, one of the most thorough, uh, all around beatdowns that, 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 uh, I can remember. And I mean, this is, this is a team that had, you know, they're more than their fair share of blowout losses going back to 2014, uh, the 56-14 to the, the Falcons, you know, Joe Flacco and the uh, Ravens beating up on them, I think jumping out to a 35 or 38 nothing lead at, at, at one point in that game. Um, and then there were there were a couple of games last year where they um, was it was it was it last year, or the year before they lost to the Cardinals 40 to seven? I don't remember if it they lost because uh, uh, they played the Cardinals back to back, right? Um, and yeah, consecutive seasons, yeah. right? Um, and it was like real early in the year too, right? Like second, second or third game, I think, uh, in the season for yeah. both years. Um, I, I, Ren, do you remember when the the Bucks lost like forty to seven? Was that the first? The the twenty what is twenty sixteen twenty sixteen I think I wanna, yeah I want to think that was because that was like the first year that we had that the first oh, really to the, big to the, blo- Cardinals? to the Cardinals yeah it's that first yeah, like really yeah. big blowout under Mike Smith yeah it was close till about five minutes and a half time and Chris Conti gave up two over his head and uh, and the route was on ugly yeah. ugly yes ugly. ugly and and then and then to to go to Arizona to me like that when last year when they went back to Arizona that was a real gut check uh, game like mm-hmm. if you if you wanted to prove that you know that was behind you and that that you weren't the same team that you that you were a team that 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 9 and 7 record in 2016 was for real mm-hmm. Then, then that was the game. I think that was the game last year where where I I was like, oh, oh, they're 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 in trouble. It, they might have dropped to to two and three, um, or two and two, or two and three. I can't I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but but to to fall and now they made it close, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, well, it, that that final score really doesn't mean much because they were they were way down at halftime and it was just it was just playing catch up uh after that yeah that's you know and that's i feel that's a common theme that's been going through with the mike smith the defense ever since he's been here uh we can even go like go back 2016 again the rams came in they hadn't scored an offensive touchdown their first two games and i they the first time to get the ball they marched down right down the field and that ends up being like a you know, one of those crazy high scoring forty two to forty games, which the Bucks lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it and it just seems to be this common thread. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, where did you where did you fall on on uh the Mike Smith dismissal? Uh I know it's sort of hard to not be for it, but uh do you think he got a fair shake or or is you know, do you think it's his fault or the player's fault or somewhere in between? Like where do you fall on it? Well, you're right. It's it's complicated. It's a uh, it's uh, it's any number of things. I mean, you can't you can't you can't excuse Mike Smith, um, but you know at the same time he's he's not he's not the guy on the field right. uh, jumping jumping routes and and um, missing tackles. Um, 
where where I came down on it was uh, I don't think that there was a good solution here. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like either way the uh, the the Bucks uh, were were going to lose. Um, with with Mike Smith, I it 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 strikes me the firing. Uh, I wrote this um, Monday um, Monday afternoon that it, it it strikes me as a desperate move. Um, I don't really know what what changes uh, by by firing Mike Smith and promoting uh, elevating uh, Mark Duffner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. Uh, I'm sorry to say I I don't see. I don't see this marking a dramatic turnaround. Uh, and, and part of me, um, you know, when, when the calls for Smith's firing started, you know, that, that was, that was my, my thought. Well, what, what do you do? Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to bring in somebody from outside the organization, right? right. You know, you're probably going to promote someone within, and, and, and these guys, they, they all, they all know each other. I mean, that maybe there are some philosophical differences, but for the most part, they, they all, they all know each other. Dirk Cutter, uh, Mike Smith and, and Mark Duffner were all in, in, in Jacksonville together. So, you know, I don't know that you'll see, uh, you know, a big, uh, shift in, in, in philosophy and strategy and scheme. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I think this is the last card that, that Dirk Cutter has to play. He knows his job is on the line. Uh, Jason Light knows his job is on the line. Um, and do you, do you, do you, do you continue with the status quo uh, <laughs> or, or do you, do you play this card and, 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 and hope that, Hope that it changes. I don't. I don't see that coming. And I think at a certain point, this not only puts Dirk Cutter in the crosshairs, right? Mm-hmm. It puts Jason Light squarely in in the crosshairs. Now, uh, Tom, I, I was going to say, dive into that because what, like, I could I could understand you saying putting Dirk Cutter, but what is this? Uh, what What does this have to do specifically with Jason Light? Well, these are his players, right? You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, during the press conferences, it 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 it, it amuses me when I hear, um, "Well, these are my guys. My guys are my guys." You, you hear the coaches say that, right? Yeah. And in, in a way, it sounds like a vote of confidence. Uh, and and in another way, it's kind of like, "Well, hey, these are my guys. I'm, I'm working with what I have here." <laughs> right. <laughs> to the game. Uh, man. You know, and, and kind of, kind of, kind of no, not so subtly pointing the the finger at 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 the guy, um, the guy getting the players. At, at at this point, what we'll what we'll see now is whether whether the coaching, whether the scheme, um, whether that's whether that's the issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it's and if it's not the issue, then then don't you have to wonder about? Um, the, the players that they have on the field and, and who's responsible for, for getting those players. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you go back to, to me, you know, I understand um, the direction they went in 2014 and 2015 in the drafts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, what Jason light inherited uh, was, was a mess. And it was, I think it was even worse than, than maybe a, a, a casual fan might've, might've realized uh, when they hired um, uh, Lovey Smith and, and, and Jason Light, that offense was in shambles. Right. And, and, and to their credit, you know, they, they, they saw where the, where the, they, they recognized that saw where the NFL was heading, that it, you know, it's it's uh, football outsiders. This is one of their tenants. It's it's four parts offense, three parts defense, and I think one part special teams. You know, that's that's if you now of course there there are exceptions to that. You look at the Denver Broncos a few years ago. That was a defense team, a historically great defensive team. Mm-hmm. But but for the most part, you want to be tilted uh, toward uh, your strength being on the offense. Uh, so I understand them going 
pretty much all in with, with offense in 2014 and 2015. What happened, what happened is in 2016, you, you had neg- neglected the draft defensively for a couple of years to do that. So you, right. so, some teams can, can completely miss on a draft and survive it. You can't, you just can't when you go all in on the offense for a couple of years and then you start building the defense. You, you, you got to hit on those guys. And, and let's go through that, through the top of that draft. Sure. Jordan Hargraves. Okay. Yeah. Noah Spence. Okay. Then you trade up for Roberto Aguayo. <laughs> I mean, and really, I mean, it really, that, that is to me, that, that is like, remember when Isaiah Johnson ran straight into the wall on mm-hmm. Monday night football against yeah. the Steelers, yeah. just yeah. smack into the wall. Right. Right. That, that to me is what the Roberto Aguayo picks. Things are progressing. The arrow is pointing up and then bam, you trade, you trade, you pay an expensive price in those two draft picks to, to move up in the first place. And then you take a kicker. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that means, that means the guys you drafted in front of them have to work out. Vernon Hargraves has to work out. Noah Spence has to work out. And then Ryan Smith, the, the, the guy that they took after um, Aguayo, mm-hmm. has to work out. And those guys haven't. I mean, it's, it, it really goes back to the, to, to the 2016 draft. Yeah. And, so and when, I, when, I, when I say, you know, yeah, I, you know, I understand why, why people called for Mike Smith, you know, a, a, a team record 173 points, I think, in, in five games. Like, I, mm-hmm. I get it. People aren't happy. They, they, want, they want something to change. Um, I, I think, I think uh, uh, not a lot of people are going, going to want to hear this, but, but the change that needs to happen might only take place in time. With a whole new defensive philosophy, because Mark Duffner is basically running Mike Smith's defense. You know, I, I, I really, I, I, it's hard for me to say what his his philosophy is going to be, and and how much of a group effort that'll be. But mm-hmm. let me let me say this: Let's talk about uh, Mark Duffner for a minute. Sure. Head coach at Maryland from 1992 to 1996. First year he was on the job. Uh, as head coach there, his defense ranked 100th in the country. Next year, it ranked 105th out of 106. The second worst defense hmm. in terms of points allowed in the country. Next year, 86, trending in the right direction. Then by 95, 50, 50th, and then 96. 40, 41st, and then and then he was fired. The, the, those Maryland teams, uh, his record at Maryland was was twenty and thirty five. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I went, I believe he went to be linebackers coach at at Cincinnati. After that, was eventually promoted to defensive coordinator. His last year in Cincinnati, two thousand two, the Bengals gave up twenty eight point five points per game, which ranked last in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know that Mark year. Duffner is the solution here. I don't know that Brenton Buckner was was going to be the, right. the, the solution. You know, I know there's there's a, uh, there's there was that report that um, there was a, a preference among the players for for Buckner. But how how confident do you feel with the way that defensive line has played? Uh, they're, they're they're not getting enough pressure. Uh, there there's there's no there's no there's no good answer here. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, um, let me ask you this. Can you clarify something for us, Tom? Um, sure. Mark Duffner getting promoted. Uh, cause I'm still not super clear on this cause I haven't seen anything from the organization itself. I've, I've seen a few things from like Rappaport and other people, but is Mark Duffner just the interim? Like, and, and, you know, let's, let's play the what if game and say, what if dirt cutter keeps his job this year? Are they, you know, is the plan to conduct a full, like, Sur- like a, a real search for a new defensive coordinator of which dark Mark Duffner may possibly at least get an interview for that. Or, uh, you know, is the idea that, you know, Mark Duffner is going to be the defensive coordinator going forward under the cutter regime, however long that lasts. 
my my feeling, and this is just my feeling, um, is that I would expect them, if Cutter were to keep his job, if everybody were to keep their jobs, that um, they would conduct a, a search uh, at the end of the season. Now, having said that, uh, right now I would apply the interim label to everyone. <laughs> Including Dirk right, Cutter, right, right. including Jason Light, it's interim for everyone. And the the next uh, eleven, twelve weeks, where we're in save your job territory. You just did a really interesting article uh, about blitzing. A lot of Tampa Bay fans have been on Mike Smith. Uh, for not blitzing enough uh, last year and early this year. Uh, when I watched the games, I thought he blitzed. You know, I, I really didn't know what people were talking about. Now, the blitz never got there. And, you know, you went on and did your research and wrote this article. Can you go ahead and uh, tell us, you know, wrap it up in a nutshell, what you found and, and why blitzing from your research is not necessarily the answer? Well, uh, quite simply, uh, when they blitzed, it didn't work. Uh, when they blitzed Drew Brees, it didn't work. When they blitzed Nick Foles, it didn't work. When they blitzed Ben Roethlisberger, it didn't work. Uh, Mitch Trubisky didn't work. I mean, you 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 get the picture. Um, now, you know, you you know, blitzing isn't going to solve uh, the blown coverages. I mean, we're, we've been seeing guys run wide open. Right. It, it, to me. When I watched, and, and the numbers support this, um, that it wasn't it wasn't so much a timing issue. Some of these guys had a lot of time, you know, back in the past, but the guys weren't getting open necessarily because of the amount of time that they had. That certainly exacerbated the problem. Uh, but they were they were getting open because guys were falling down in coverage. Guys were uh, there was one play uh, against the Bears where I remember seeing Justin Evans run ten yards up the field to, to cover a, a shallow route that was already being covered by one or two other players, leaving a vacancy out in the middle of the field. Uh, you know, there were, were guys jumping routes, leaving. Uh, remember that Bellamy touchdown against the Bears? Yep. I think two players jumped on. Um, uh, I, I can't remember whether it was Howard or, or Cohen out in the flat, but they, they, they jumped the, the, the route out in the flat, leaving Bellamy wide open. Blitzing isn't going to fix those issues. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my feeling is you've got, you've got a very young secondary. Um, And, you know, I I gave a lot of credit to um, like this, uh, this past draft, or I feel like I I gave some credit for, for trading down and then collecting uh, as many defensive backs as he did. Mm-hmm. Um, because you don't know, going back to Hargraves, you don't know whether these guys are going to work out. The one thing about the NFL draft that we know is that we don't know. Um, and the, the, the guy that you, you know, the, the, the player, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a paper uh, that's, that's, uh, that's been out there for, for maybe a couple of decades now where a couple of economists study the NFL draft and they found that the chance of uh, you taking a player at a position being better than the next player taken at that position is virtually a coin flip. Uh, so you're 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 just rolling. It's a lottery. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, I gave a lot of credit to him for for um, stocking up on defensive backs. They needed to, especially with Brent Grimes turning thirty five. Mm-hmm. Um, but defensive back especially in today's NFL where where you can't you can't touch receivers you you can't disrupt their routes uh, receivers can we we've some seen some instances and and this isn't con- called consistently where receivers actually grab onto the defensive backs the the receivers initiate the contact and it's mm-hmm. not called um it's incredibly difficult to play defensive back. And then you factor in today's pass happy uh, rules and uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a learning curve there. You know, it's, it's just going to take, I think reps and, and, and time before we know for sure what these guys have. It's going to take experience. Tom, um, let, me, let me ask you this. Let me jump in here. Um, so as yeah. the analytics guy, um, what are some things 
specific to the defense uh, that you see that you've seen from your perspective uh, that that need to be fixed, that need to be improved, that possibly could be improved uh, this year, given you know, given the guys that we have and the system that we have and where we are. Like, what can they actually improve on some of these things? And then what are issues that maybe aren't necessarily related to the defense or, or maybe team-wide, uh, kind of from an analytics thing that might, you know, things that might be holding the team back from uh, from, from winning, quite frankly? Yeah, now, it, it, it's hard to, off the, the top of my head, it's hard to point to, to you know, specific analytics, um, uh, in regard to the defense and, and say this is where they, they need to get better. I think I can see, I'm seeing the same thing you guys are seeing, that there's really not enough pressure consistently up front. Mm-hmm. I, I want to say the Bucks generate uh, pressure roughly, it's less than 25%. I want to say it's in the neighborhood of 22%, uh, which is going to rank toward the bottom of the NFL. So they're just not generating enough pressure on the quarterback. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the that's the number one thing, um, you know. And and the other thing is 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 I think I think they're pretty solid in in relatively speaking uh, run defense. Mm-hmm. You know, the it's it's the pass defense that is just exceptionally bad. Um, and you know, I don't know. You know, without without a pass rush, without a consistent pressure, and uh, and with a young secondary, it's really just not. It's just not really a great combination. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I to go back to the the, the blitzing question. Uh, you know, I, I get I get why people might want to see the Bucks try something different. You know, but often when we talk about blitzing, I think we're thinking about the rewards and not the cost. Right. Uh, you know, when you when you blitz, you're taking somebody out of out of coverage, and when you've got youth back there, and and, and well, and also an aging thirty uh, Brent, Brent Grimes, and and maybe guys who who uh, who don't always hold their positions. You know, we see we see, you know, Justin Evans has a lot of range, but sometimes he's he's way out of position. Quan Alexander is is sometimes taking bad angles or is out of position. You know, and 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 the the tackling. Um, you know, I saw moments um, uh, against the. Um, um, who did they just play? Falcons. Falcons. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I saw moments against the, the the Falcons where where they were just missing tackles. Um, so, uh, you know. I don't. I don't feel really any better about sending uh, an extra rusher when that means you're probably leaving one of your your defensive backs out there on an island. You know, people will say, "Okay, well, you got to press Julio Jones." Well, if Julio Jones beats that press, you've got a single high safety. You're done. You're done. Then you're giving up a, a sixty or seventy yard play. And I, I think, I, you know, without. You know, sitting down and and, and having a one on one with with Mike Smith, you know that's that's my feeling of what he was trying to do uh, is is make sure that they were giving up uh, forty yard plays and and hoping that at some point, you know, uh, that they were going to surrender catches, they were going to surrender yards, mm-hmm. that at some point they'd um, They'd get lucky and, and force some turnovers. That was really why they had success in 2016. If you if you look at it, was a sudden yeah. spike in in the rate of turnovers. It wasn't that 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 they were suddenly a better pass rushing team or, or a much better defense. It was turnovers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're so absolutely you, right. you got to you got to pressure the quarterback. You got to get turnovers. And yeah. you know, easier said than done, but. Those are those are two areas where they're severely lacking. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned you know they're they're trying not to give up the forty yard uh, plays. Unfortunately, it happened. <laughs> they were giving them up. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, I don't yep. know that it was exactly forty yards, but I mean, the number of explosive plays, or how we would define explosive plays in Tampa, that occurred on our defense, uh, it 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 just it's jaw dropping uh, to be to be quite frank. You know, it is. It is, and and um, like I've been saying, I I don't see um, 
I don't I don't see a quick fix. So, so you know, me... it was it was like Mike Smith said, I think, during his last press conference. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you want to die a, a slow death or do you want to die a fast death? I mean, that's that's kind of what we're looking at here. Sure. So, I, I mean, l- let me ask you this then uh, with I mean, understanding all of that, there's not really going to be a quick fix. It It probably will not result in huge changes this year. Um, just given all the challenges, there might be some different changes. There might be a new energy or a new whatever, but you know, it's, it, it's, you got to wait and see how that translates to the field in between the whistles, you know? Um, mm-hmm. but is there something to that of the idea of, of, um, a lot of fans will talk about accountability that, that this firing is, is less to do with trying to fix everything and, and have this super stellar thing. Cause it, you know, what we have is what we have. And if this is what it's going to be like for the rest of the season, then so be it. I mean, obviously they want to try to fix it, but is it, is this could be more about, you know, Mike Smith's the guy in charge two and a half seasons in it. It's not an anomaly. I mean, this is something that continues to happen. Uh, you know, I understand he was using anomaly meaning for this particular year, but when we look at the right. entire context of his, of his tenure here in Tampa, it's not been an anomaly. Um, it, it, you know, you're closer there than we are, <laughs> you know, um, do you get the, the sense that maybe it has more to do with that and accountability and just saying, Hey, we're not going to put up with it and we're going to, we're going to do something and hold somebody accountable for what's happening. And, you know, um, it, it, cause we've also said you, you're the worst team in the league. You literally can't get worse. I mean, it, it, well, first of all, do you buy that particular uh, line of reasoning. Uh, I think it. I think it really comes down to results, and and the yeah. results weren't there. You know, uh, you know. I think Cutter was asked um, within the past couple of weeks about his relationship with with Mike Smith, right? Mm-hmm. And he said that um, you know that a, a friendship wouldn't wouldn't dictate um, you know his his decision making. That mm-hmm. that that wouldn't that wouldn't be a factor. Um, you know, I, it was certainly, I think we can, we can all agree, uh, and, and, and assume that it was a factor in Mike Smith getting the job in the first place. But I think it really comes down to, uh, results, the, the demands for, for, for accountability and the satisfaction over someone getting fired. That's a fleeting thing. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what you ultimately want to see is, is results and what, what's the ba- best path to get those results. Um, and, and, you know, we're, uh, we're, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. Um, you know, I don't know that, um, that, that making this, this change is, is, is going to produce those results. Right. Right. So. You know, tell me if you agree with this. As Bucks fans, should we just, for the rest of this year, just tell the like think think this way: the offense goes out there, they got to put up forty, or they're going to lose the game. And like, don't even look at what the other other team's score is. Like, if you haven't got forty yet, keep going for it. If you're inside the forty yard line on the other end of the field and it's fourth and eight or less, just 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 go for it. Like. Don't kick a field goal. You got to get touchdowns, and maybe the defense will show up. You know, two or three times this year. Are are we in that boat? Like, is is that the best we can hope for as Buck fans? <laughs> that's that sounds like a pretty grim forecast, but I guess that's what I'm what I'm painting. Um, you know, I think. You know, going back to, uh, I think Brent asked this question. You know, kind of what other what other metrics can we can we look to beyond beyond the offense? I mean, but beyond the the uh, defense. See the 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 I think the offense is is a playoff caliber offense. Now, you know, I I, I talked a little bit on on Twitter uh, about uh, Jameis Winston's uh, interceptions. But but as a whole, I think this this offense is a playoff caliber um, offense. Um, but when you have a defense as bad as this, yeah, you know, I, I think your your offense has to has to be almost perfect. Uh, and and it's it's not you know something we don't talk about much, 
but the the special teams uh, is not uh, is not uh, a unit that produces an advantage for this Bucks team. So when you have uh, a way below historically bad defense and a below average special teams, yeah, you know, yes, your your offense is going to have to be perfect. I mean, think about it. Yeah. They they don't have an advantage in 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 extra points or in field goals. They don't have an advantage in their kick return game. They don't have an advantage in their punt return game. So you're 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 losing you're you're going to lose the field position battle. Mm. Uh so it it you know, I don't think Jameis Winston had to be perfect on on Sunday, but what he he couldn't do and what the the team can't do is turn the ball over in the red zone. That's mm-hmm. the most important zone of the field to succeed. And when you turn the ball in the red over in the red zone, uh, you're, 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 you're just taking points off the board, whether it's three or it's seven. I think if they, they score now, you know, I should, I should, I should back up and say, I don't think that, that, um, that turnover was solely, uh, Winston's responsibility, uh, Winston's fault either. I want to mm-hmm. say on that drive, maybe uh, they ran on first down, right? They, I think they got to the two. Correct me if I'm wrong. They We're got to the deflection, two, and right? then there was a there was a penalty on second down that pushed them back. False start on Eau Claire. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know that in in the red zone that that there's too much of a difference on on second down between second and 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 goal from the two and second goal from the seven you know there there could even be an advantage of being a little bit farther back you have more space to work with but Mm -hmm. you know it 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 almost takes the run out of the equation there especially the way this team is running especially on the right side caleb Mm -hmm. benenock is a problem i see him consistently get beat uh there were there were a few runs early on where i i saw i saw a lane i saw space for for the for the for the Peyton Barber, Ronald Jones, and you know whoever was was uh, Benenock's responsibility was in the backfield, uh, you know hold you know resulting in either a loss or just a one yard gain. Right. Um, so, but yeah, that that totally took the um, the, uh, the 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 run out of the equation, and yeah, you've you've got to be perfect in the red zone. Yeah, I think I, I it. Uh, I think I've seen recently a stat that the Bucks are only about. I think it's like fifty six percent or something in their efficiency in the red zone, and the uh, the average for like say the top ten teams in efficiency is somewhere around the upper sixties to to low seventies. Um, and then uh, the the defense, as far as not stopping people in the end zone, is is yeah. upwards of like ninety something odd percent. Which is is just, and it's the worst in the league, uh, as is a lot of stuff with this defense. Um, you know the, the it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's really strange on offense too because you 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 would think that that percentage would be much higher, and yeah. you know it, it it confuses me. I mean they've they've got the 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 weapons in the in the red zone, mm-hmm. you know between Brait and and um, OJ Howard. Uh, Mike Evans, uh, you know, even Adam Humphreys, Deshaun Jackson isn't too much of a factor in the red zone. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I something that's kind of been been on my mind lately is is their lack of a of a pass catching running back. You know, somebody a running back that can can line up anywhere on the field. So many teams have this now, mm-hmm. um, and they they don't necessarily spend high draft picks on them. But if you're going to spend a high draft pick on a running back. Let's make sure he can catch the football. Let's make sure he can pass protect. Let's make sure he can line up wide. And we've seen with um, with the with the Saints, obviously, uh, but then uh, with uh, with the Steelers and Connor, uh, and then with the Bears, and uh, even Tevin Coleman uh, caught a pass uh, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, opponents, you know, are uh, are able to attack the Bucks defense, um, and it's not just the Bucks, but just you know, pass catching running backs throughout the NFL uh, is is such a huge advantage and one that the the Bucks don't have. So maybe maybe that's part of their issues in in the in the red zone. Re- remember a couple of weeks ago, right, that uh, Ronald Jones, you know, was was wide open in the flat and and dropped yeah. that pass, and that was a real drive killer. 
So now, to be fair, yeah, though, perhaps, Tom, to be fair, I, I, I did see both Peyton Barber and Ronald Jones catch passes in this last game, which was really nice to see. <laughs> like, like it, it mm-hmm. I, I made a note about it while I was watching. I was like, oh, look, they caught a pass. <laughs> you know, uh, unfortunately, as you just brought up, there has also been the you know examples like that Ronald Jones, uh, like that Ronald Jones deal there in the back. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so. yeah and, and and if I may, um, you know, uh, yeah. very early on in the game, do you remember, do you guys remember the sequence where they were down? I think they were down seven six, and Mike Evans caught uh, caught that pass, the one where he he uh, he uh, ended up breaking the franchise record for receiving yards. Mm-hmm. They got yeah. to midfield, yep. and then there was a there was a sequence there where. Um, I want to say on first down they ran and Donovan Smith looked like he just couldn't, just wasn't quick enough to, to, um, so to where he the, took a playoff. Uh, what's that? It's, it's, he, he, like, he took the whole play. Are you talking about the one? It's like, he took the whole playoff. Like he let his man go like way early and his guy wound like, cause the play was to the other side of the line was to the right side of the line. Right. Donovan right. Smith let his guy yeah, go I, and I his guy he, ran he over to the, the right. Yeah. But, but yeah, he, 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 he was, it looked like he was late at the very least. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe he did the, take the playoff. I, you know, I don't know, but you're right. The, the play, play went to the other side and it was yeah. Donovan Smith's guy who, who made the tackle. Right. So, so they're, so they're in second and 12 maybe. Uh, and, uh, I want to say on that second down, that's when, um, uh, um, uh, Jameis Winston went deep to Chris Godwin. Mm-hmm. Right down the down the sideline, yep. and crossing over the middle was Deshaun Jackson, and he was open. Right. And that's the thing with that that Falcons defense. It's something that I wrote about in my in my preview. Is that they're going to give you six or seven yards per play. You know, take it if they're going to give it to you. Take it yeah. if they're going to say, "Hey, we're going to make you string together ten plays to score a touchdown." Just take it. Uh, and 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 we see this. Uh, and it's not just the interceptions. We see we see this aggressiveness with Winston sometimes, where he just doesn't take what's there, and and that that is is really key, I think, to his next development. It, whether that's taking what's there or whether that's giving up on a play, mm-hmm. uh, and and I, I'm just not seeing that step yet. And and that ended up being a really uh, critical series because they ended up punting from about midfield, and and if you if you want to keep up with with an offense like the Falcons, if you're concerned about your defense, you 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 got to strike. You get yeah. to midfield. Yeah, if you're going to you know, tra- if you're going to get trade at least blows. three points on the board. Yeah, if you're right. if you're going to trade blows, go bow for blow. You can't you can't afford to have back to back to back series where you're not putting points up on the board. So, well, Tom, man, I really thank you for coming on and, and uh, agreeing to be, you know, kind of be a part of the show. And, um, you know, is there anything you'd like to leave us with kind of here as, as we wrap this up here? Well, uh, I, I just say this, um, that, uh, as we, as we turn our attention to the Browns, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, when, when the schedule came out, right, we, we looked at, opening against the saints and and the Eagles and the Steelers. How big is this game? Yeah. 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 This is going to be, you know, I know I said it for the bears game, but this is sort of the litmus test for me again for, for the defense because (laughs) I just, well, I just finished watching the Falcons game and that second half defense looked good. You know, it, uh, I watched the condensed version. The guys weren't wide open. It seemed for most times people were where they were supposed to be. There wasn't a ton of confusion. Guys weren't, uh, like I said, running wide open. Uh, but, you know, with me, enough's enough. Like, we, we, we've seen this movie before. But if Baker Mayfield comes into Tampa and puts up, like, throws for, like, four touchdowns and the Bucks lose, I, I don't I don't even – I mean – pack it up man you know I, I try i always try to be the optimist but you can't you cannot lose this game and expect to go anywhere the next eight games are very winnable for how tough this early schedule is these next eight are very winnable the bucks should go six and two in my opinion with this offense having to score 40 points but they can't go any worse than five and three or i, or I think the season's over 
Yeah, and 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 real quick about uh, the the second half defense uh, against the Falcons. This is going to blow some people's minds. It's going to blow them away. So they they gave up what ten points in the second half. Mm-hmm. They blitzed less than they did in the first half. <laughs> And, they blitzed uh, twelve times in the in the first half, I think, and eight in the second half. For what it's worth. Welcome back to the Pewtercast. That was Tom Bassinger of the Tampa Bay Times. You can follow him at Tom Metrics. Uh, Ren, it has come to that part of the show, my friend, where it is time for us to give our final thoughts on the Bucks at the Falcons game as we kind of dial it in towards that and then to grade out this team. So, man, I will throw it to you first. What final thoughts do you have as we look to turn the page on the Falcons game? Well, it's kind of really hard to have final thoughts since now that Mike Smith has been fired, you, you know, um, I guess we're going to have to see the Browns game before you kind of – because you, you want to talk about the defense. Like, this can't continue. Something needs to change. Right. And, you know, they since – changed. <laughs> yeah, and, and so it's changed. So, right. uh, okay, you know, uh, offense stay the same. Um, <laughs> keep putting up points and, and, and move it up and down the field. So, sure. yeah, uh, nothing really to add that's, you know, <clears throat> that – I've rewatched the game, so – uh, except the defense did they did they looked good in the second half they really did um yeah. you know they 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 shut the uh falcons down for you know i think the whole third quarter but uh you know they just needed one more stop and uh yeah. they could they just couldn't get it so right you know. yeah i yeah i mean <laughs> i don't know it, it, it's hard for me to say that and then still be able to turn around and be like, and Mike Smith absolutely deserved to be fired. I, I know Tom seemed a little more res- reticent uh, than to just come out and say that he thought Mike Smith needed to be fired because uh, – and he's right. It's it's And Dirk Cutter said the same thing, right? Like it's bigger than one man. But in a results-oriented business and things in life, I think in general, yeah, one person's going to be responsible for it, right? Like, yeah. It may be more than one person's deal, but somebody's, uh, you know, somebody's going to be responsible. And you know, to that, can't fire the whole defense. No, but I tell you what, you could have fired. And we said this way back in the off season, and I meant to say it with Tom. It just didn't work itself into the conversation. I am, I am still shocked that the only coaching change that we made on the defensive side of the ball was to get rid of Jay Hayes. Yeah, like okay. I, I, you know. I think Mike Smith might have been able to save his job had he maybe turned over some more people on his staff, uh, particularly in the secondary. Because let, let's face it, the secondary guys aren't necessarily getting it done, or maybe maybe not getting it done. And I'm I'm not going down the route of saying that they can't develop young cornerbacks. I'm not going to do that because you know <laughs> I I remember your tirade on that, and you're right about that. You know, you don't know where they start and and where they finish, but you know, in a results oriented deal. Um, you know, let's, where's the, where's the really weak spot of this defense? It's in that secondary, right? I would say it's communication because it seems to be when they do communicate, they can put up a good half of football. Right. You know, I talked about it on the Instacast. Like they're just, you know, all the stuff where you say, yeah, he doesn't blow coverages, he doesn't miss tackles, he doesn't, you know, miscommunicate with them. But it's his job for them to not miscommunicate. You right. know, it's his job to get them to communicate. It's his job to ultimately to not miss tackles. It's mm-hmm. his job ultimately to get pressure on the quarterback. It's his job ultimately not to tell them to not line up on the first down marker ten yards off the receiver mm-hmm. and then go into a back pedal immediately. So when the receiver hits the first down marker and, tur- and turns around, you're seven yards off him. Yep. You know, it, it's I, I I get like the cushion and the slow death, but you got to compete, man. Yeah. And the team and the and the defense has not been ready in the first half of any ball game. 
this season. Fair enough. And you can probably go, I, yeah. and you can go back to last season too. Yeah. Like how many times after three times, you know, the, the other team gets the ball three times and you're down two scores. I mean, it'd be, it'd be, yeah. you, know, you know, 10, nothing, 14, nothing, you know, it's just 17, nothing, 21. Nothing. It just happens. It's been happening game after game, after right. game, after game. So, you know, you could say, well, he doesn't miss tackles and this. Well, he got his job because he taught people how not to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you get paid and you get your job and, well, you've never made a tackle. Right. You've never you've never not blown a coverage. So I, 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 I never really liked that answer. But, yeah, I would say communication would be the weakest would be the weakest part. OK, fair enough. Um, and where it shows up the most, then I would say, would be mostly in the secondary. Uh, it, it, but it, and I bring that up to say, you know, the defensive line hasn't looked stellar either. Mm-mm. You know, I mean, this, this whole season, they really haven't. And especially in this last game, I, I, you know, I mean, JPP. Okay, great. He's, he's got what five sacks now, I think on the season. Cool. Keep going JPP. Uh, and I'm not going to sit back and say, Oh, well, why doesn't he have eight? Um, you know he's got five. That's that's a sight better than everybody else on the team. But I mean they they really haven't been exactly shutting it down. So you know it it makes me wonder. It, you know was Mike Smith putting some sort of uh, limit on these guys, some sort of of limiting factor? And you know it, it. I don't I don't wish to dive necessarily into leadership theory or anything like that. But the there is a basic idea that you'll never go higher than the the leadership limit of your of your guy of your head guy. So um if that's where if that was on Mike Smith, that is a change that could potentially happen. Yeah, you know, it just depends on what's going to happen here with Duffner and and we'll see. We'll see come this weekend. But we're talking about this past game. Uh, as far as the things, I don't really have anything I think from the defense that I can really talk about, especially since as you pointed out Everything's now changed, and we don't know what the defense is going to look like going forward. So I did have a couple of thoughts from the offense, a few things that didn't uh, necessarily get to be talked about on the instant cast, specifically as it relates to Jameis. So, um, Ren, uh, before I dive into my notes that I have here, did you have anything specifically maybe from the offense or from Jameis uh, that you saw that that, uh, you haven't been able to talk about yet? Uh, I, I'm probably going to stay away from the Jameis talk unless it's brought up in an email. Okay. Um, I think it's the same thing we've been talking about since he sort of got into the league. Uh, you know, he keeps improving mm-hmm. all his stats, but I mean, you throw, you know, hey, you threw two picks and they're both in the red zone. Well, one was a bomb and one was, uh, you know, if he throws that pass 10 times, I think. I don't think he gets picked once, you know, mm-hmm. by hitting the guy in the back or the butt or the helmet. You know, it, there's so many ways that ball could bounce. Right. But it did, and he threw the pick. So, you know, that's that. And uh, so, like, I'm sure we'll get into it. But I guess going back to this is the first time where the Buccaneers actually played a football game where mm-hmm. somebody wasn't way out in front or they weren't way behind. Mm-hmm. And you saw that, hey, Peyton Barber, the running game, it's pretty good. Yeah, Peyton Barber wasn't bad. Ronald Jones wasn't bad. Like, uh, you know, so I, I'd be interested to see those two continue to go head to head over the course of the season, for sure. But I mean, I, I actually I, this is probably Ronald Jones' best game uh, that he's had. And he's only had two right now, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, even if you take into account his preseason games and even what we saw out of him in in uh, practice and stuff, I think this is the best that I have personally seen Ronald Jones look. Yeah, I think he ran by the once, maybe twice, and they threw to him, you know, three or four times. So it was definitely the most involved. And I would like to see the Bucks get a little more creative, uh, you know, with his routes. It seemed everything was like a, like, you know, like a out route to the sidelines and, mm-hmm. oh, everyone's covered. Okay, throw it to Ronald Jones type of deal. Um, you know, we saw it in preseason with that wheel route that he caught for a, a big gainer. And I think it's coming. And, you know, Tom talked a little about this, about this, you know, this back that needs to be able to catch in this third down back. And you've seen the Patriots do it for years as they, mm-hmm. you know, like they had LeGarrette Blunt, but then they had like white and Lewis. And, you know, uh, I picked up white late, late in my fantasy draft. And like, I have to play him now. Like he's scoring somewhere between 26 to 31 points a game. 
and he doesn't get into like the second quarter, you know, but once he get, you know, every time he catches the ball to point. <laughs> so, you know, he, he's, uh, he's backs like this are very valuable. And I think that's what the bucks are hoping Ronald Jones can turn into. Um, not necessarily the sledgehammer mm-hmm. or a every down back, but a guy that can come in, uh, you know, for, um, three or four series and really, make mismatches for the defense of, of linebackers trying to cover him and uh you know just march down the field with him okay Ren. so let me ask you this do you i i know it's only been two games and i know this is way 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 too early but do you see ronald jones on a trajectory to overtake peyton barber as the lead back for the tampa bay buccaneers possibly even this year no i don't think so not this year i don't think he'll Dirk Hutter's really slow to trust rookie running backs. You know, it took Peyton Barber like three years to get where he is now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, starting the pack, the squad, and sort of buried in the depth chart. And, and uh, you know, if Doug Martin wouldn't have fallen off a cliff, he he, he probably would still be there. Right. Uh, yeah. But no, and we'll see going forward. I think his development is slower than the Bucks anticipated, but mm-hmm. you know, I also think that. If somebody doesn't have to play, like I think Carlton Davis is the only one who would probably be playing at this point on the defense. You know, Vive in a small rotation role, uh-huh. slightly getting bigger. Ronald Jones in a small rotation role, slightly getting bigger. But when, if everyone was healthy, we had Grimes the outside and Vern on the outside. We went to nickel. Then would I think Ronald? I think Carlton Davis would have won the job from Ryan Smith. Sure. And then sure. we have Evans and Conti in the back, but you know, now it's necessity. You got to play Stewart, got to play right. uh, Carlton Davis, got to play Whitehead. Uh, and I'm not too terribly upset about it. You know, um, I think mm. Vernon's. I think Vernon was really. I think they miss him a lot because it seemed that they were counting on him to be sort of the quarterback this year back there. You yeah. know, if you listen to in mm-hmm. training camp where Vernon was like, yeah, well, they expect me to be, you know, they're putting a lot of responsibility on my shoulders this year and expect me to, to be a good player, a great player. And he, and he was like, I accept it. And you saw it in training camp and you mm-hmm. saw it in the preseason. You even, you know, you even saw it in the three quarters he got to play for the Saints game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he put up, he got like a forced to fumble, had a pass breakup. You know, he was doing I mean, his things. injury went out on a bit on a big play. He was making yeah. a big play, and it's, yeah. that's where he the injury happened. Yeah, broke up the pass. Right. Yeah, Drew Brees threw it so hard it ripped his labrum. Right. Um. So, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so, uh, to I guess sort of put a button up about Ronald Jones. Um, I don't see him because I think we still haven't really seen the best of Peyton Barber. I think mm-hmm. if the defense can keep teams from you know not scoring 24 or more points in the first half i think what we saw against atlanta peyton barber is the peyton barber we're probably going to see week in and week out yeah yeah i'm i'm with you on that so uh, the only other thought that and i do want to jump back to talk about Jameis and just specifically what i what i saw of of Jameis here for really the first time this season because uh, I don't really count the Chicago Bears as as seeing Jameis in his big season debut. Yeah. Um, I, I just, it, yes, I know. I guess technically it counts, but it wasn't. It, you know, Jameis is walking into a thirty point deficit. Like it, it's not. And I haven't thrown a football in a yeah, live game in in a month. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, you know what I saw of Jameis when I was watching it, it looked to me like he was playing harder. He was playing calmer. Uh, he was moving it around and like the couple of plays where he was scrambling around. I noted this, you, you know how Jameis would, you know, he, a sack would be on, on its way and he'd scramble out, scramble out. And he'd always keep his eyes downfield, 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 and try to make a big throw. A lot of times that's when he would make a really bad decision and throw an interception. I didn't see that this time. I saw him scrambling, scrambling, scrambling. Um, and not necessarily looking for the big throw. Uh, and there were times where like, I would have been happy for him to just go- crumble and eat the ball and, and not give up the fumble, which by the way, he didn't fumble. I know he had a yeah. couple of, of interceptions, but you know, he's, he's not fumbling this ball. Like you, I kind of see that on him. Um, you know, he would, he, he just kind of 
put the play on his back and he would scramble and keep the ball until it was time to go down. Um, which I, I feel like might be something he learned or something maybe he worked on, something maybe he's he's picked up a little bit of from Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um we'll but, to I fight mean, another day. Get yeah. three or four yards. Yep. You know, second and seven is yep. not the end of the world. Exactly. Um, and he, he need to get a few yards. So I don't think that that's something that we would have seen out of the old Jameis, at least not very much. Um, and and the other note that I had with this was, is, you know, for people that were worried about Jameis going back to his old friends, going back to his old favorites, you know, I heard that more than once over the course of this last week. Yeah, I said, I said, I was like, I'll yeah. be looking for that. So I, so I, I tracked it. You know, just to see. Um, and as far as throwing goes, I, I'm going to take out the running plays. Um, the, they did run pretty pretty well in the fir- just through the first half, right? Uh, maybe first quarter and a half. It was as far as his throwing people. He went to Godwin first, then he went to Eau Claire, then he went to Godwin, and then he went to Deshaun Jackson. And so one, two, three, four. Five passes later, he finally went to Brait, and that was the touchdown there uh, early mm-hmm. in the game on that first series. Right, second series he comes out, he finally gets to Mike. He goes to Peyton Barber actually, and then he goes to Mike Evans, and he comes back to Peyton Barber, and then he comes back to uh, Chris Godwin uh, in a pass. And it wasn't really until the end of the first half or maybe this first series that we even saw Adam Humphreys uh, get get mixed in there. Um, but I mean. It, so his preference for Brait and Humphreys, those two guys specifically, because uh, he he absolutely should return to Mike Evans, right? Like Mike Evans is the best oh, yeah. receiver on the team. You, that's not a this is my comfort blanket. It's just Mike Evans is the guy. Yeah, he actually didn't even go to Mike Evans that much, um, at least not to begin the game. You know, at least not to fall back into these old tendencies. So, you know, to me that worry, and I understand why people would be worried about that. But, I mean, he did a good job spreading the ball around. He did a good job, uh, you know, connecting with everybody. And he even had, a, you know, a couple connections with Jackson, missed a couple with Jackson. Um, I, I will say that I'm a little I'm a little disappointed that the chemistry with Jackson wasn't there. It still looks to be very similar to me. Pass as far as on both of them. Was it, it that was oh, not yeah. called because the referees, like, forgot their flags, left them back in the referee locker room? The referees let those guys play. We talked about it in yeah, we did. You know, yeah. It's like, well, you know, can't blame the refs. You know, with umpire strike zones, with umpire strike zone is. you got to adjust as a hitter right. and a pitcher. Yeah. And it seems the Falcons adjusted and the Bucks didn't. But, yeah, they're, I mean – like when Mike Evans got called for the legal motion on a deep pass, the guy was like tackling Mike Evans. Right. The interception on Godwin, the linebacker wasn't even looking and had his face mask at Godwin's chest and was tackling him to the ground. Right. Both times when Jackson was getting by the defensive back mm-hmm. on those two deep incompletions, one was a interception and one uh, fell harmlessly in the end zone. The quarterback just reached out and grabbed him. Yeah. You know, like, like put his arm and held him up. Now, 15 years ago, that's not a penalty, but this year it is. Right. And it was last year. I mean, you cannot touch the wide receiver past five yards. That's the rule, right? That's what and, the us. The rule is no, that's the rule. <laughs> like, look it up. That's the rule. Oh, I know, I but know. it just, went, yeah, but it wasn't being called, but I'm not saying that, you know, that's why the bucks lost the game. Oh, the officials blow. I said, you know, our defensive back should adjust it. Our receivers should have adjusted, right. but as far as the timing on both of those, uh, I think they would have been connection if you know if uh, he wasn't grabbed by the defender. Fair enough. All right, well, Ren, for the sake of time, why don't we go ahead and move into our grades? So, well, how did you grade out offense, defense, special teams, and then the team as a whole? I gave the defense a D minus. Uh-huh. Um, because they did, they really did. They had it. They had. Uh, I don't want to say impressive, but you know, you know, much improved. But hey, you know, you're. Uh, it's all right. Right. <laughs> you go up 24 points in the first half. Uh, can you really get any worse? Um, but they did give the offense a chance to get back in the game early in the third quarter with that, you know, uh, long completion to Humphreys, and uh, they're down at the two yard line, and then we know about the, you know, the the deflected interception and all that so um that's why they're not getting f 
uh, the offense, I give them a B minus uh, because two turnovers in the red zone. Um, but uh, I have this new red zone argument about about turnovers and interceptions. We'll probably get to it in the emails, I'm sure. Uh, it's pretty funny. Or it's not funny, but it's it's like, huh, I never really thought of it that way. Or maybe people have. We'll see. Uh, so I'm giving them a B minus because because of the costly turnovers. And then – but, you know, they did – they put up a bunch of points and and they had a chance to win at the end and you know at the 20 yard line and then the special teams uh tom talked about it man and i sort of wanted to jump in but you know he 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 tends to uh jump from subject to subject and and uh you know everything he says is is you should listen to but you know i've said this before dirk cutter it's like he doesn't even care about the special teams you know right it's like just catch, just don't fumble a punt or a kickoff. Like just don't do it. I really don't care where you come out at the twenty five, fifteen. What I really don't care about that. Just don't fumble it. You know. So he's right. Don't it's give not him the a, ball back. Don't give him the ball back. Let my offense get out there. And I think Tom's right. Like you know, there, there's really no advantage, and except when Deshaun Jackson gets back there. Uh, and then you know, Kentzar missed an extra point, and we were chasing it the whole entire game. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm we giving. Were the special teams and F because they, they, they really changed the outcome of the game in a negative way. And then, so overall D plus, I guess ah, I can't, the Dolphins did look good. Mm-hmm. They ran the ball. So I guess, yeah, I guess I'll give them a, uh, I'm going to have to go with a C C. Yeah. I guess we'll go C a little higher than a C minus all because of the offense though. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm pretty much there with you across the board. I'm also a D minus on the defense as well. I don't think it was a complete failing, but it was pretty bad. And yeah. and uh, you know if if we were to give out these grades <laughs> after the first half, it would absolutely be an F. It's um, like yeah, it's it's like they only get a D minus because they had the Chicago game. They get no. You know why they get a D minus? <laughs> this is the because I'm a teacher and I don't want you in my class next year. So I'm giving you a D minus so you pass and you move on. Wow. That's I mean it's that like wow. I really think you should probably fail but I'm going to just I'm, I'm going to pass the problem on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the wow. the the offense I I'm going to give them a B plus. I, I I you know, I don't think it was a superior stellar outing by the offense, but I thought it was pretty damn good. Good you enough know. to win a game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh they the the offense held up their end of the bargain in this game. Hands down. Now, I you know I would have liked to have seen them uh, in a shootout. I would have liked to have seen them, uh, you know, score some more points on a couple more series there through the first half. Um, but it, I mean, even still, it doesn't matter. They they still did their job. They did what they needed to do. This game, this was a game that came down to the very last final play. Um, for the and win. huh? For the win. It would have been for the win. Yeah, yeah, for the win, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the the offense did did their part. Um, and they certainly had, uh, you know, a few issues here and there, a few blurbs here and there. Um, and actually, Ren, that uh, let me pause this particular conversation because I want to go back to talking about Jameis for just a second. And this this is going to sound like a bad um, question, but uh, you're a restaurant guy. When you mm-hmm. when you run a restaurant, you build in you build into your budget and your planning the idea that you're going to have some food waste, right? Food waste, broken plates, yeah, broken glasses. You, yep. you build that in. Like, okay, so Theft. here's my question. For Jameis specifically, or for this offense, how many interceptions slash turnovers are, are we going to say is acceptable? Now, and I don't want I don't want the dirt cutter answer of well none of them are acceptable. Like <laughs> you're going right. to throw the ball, there's going to be interceptions. Just accept it. What is that kind of variance that that number that we should kind of be like, you know, you just I got you just you. take it. So I got you. Do you want a uh, like a like an overall season number? Are you looking like per game number? Um, it, I'll answer both. Yeah, Sorry. sure. Uh, overall, I think I said, you know, leading up to this year earlier that I, I think around 13 interceptions is good for a season. Now okay. you got to probably knock that down to 11 because he missed three games or maybe okay. even 10, um, you know, would be an acceptable number. You know, Jameis is always going to, Jameis is never 
probably I shouldn't say it, probably never going to lead the league with the fewest amount of interceptions. Right. You know, and I don't you know, I don't necessarily want that. If you have that, you sort of have an Alex Smith run offense, um, you know, good enough to make the playoffs. But after that, you, you know, you're not going to really go anywhere. You're out in the first round. Uh, now, per game, you know, that's a little harder with this defense. I would have to say negative one. You have to have less than zero interceptions every game for a chance to win. And, yeah. I, I, you know, for my sanity, I'm still sticking with it, man. Like, put up 40. Like, that's it. Like, don't worry about anything the defense is doing. Don't even look at the score. Act like it, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't care. Like you said, man, if, if it's halfway through the second quarter and the offense is humming and we're up 21 to 6 and it's it's – you know, third and three on the th- 41 or fourth and three on the 41. Mm-hmm. Don't kick it. Don't punt it. Go for it. Like, unless it's fourth and eight or more on the other side of the 50, I, I would just say for the rest of your go for it until the defense proves that they can, they can hold a team under 30 points. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. So with this defense, he can't throw any. Uh, to, but be reali- to be realistic, yeah. you know, probably 10, 11 by the end of the season, I, I mean, think yeah. I think would be a very good number for him. Yeah. Anything it, under 15 is acceptable for me. Sure. And, and just to clarify, I'm I'm going to I'm going to qualify that number as however they would write it in the books. So while we could sit here and say, well, yeah, that he threw that one, but it really wasn't his fault because of X, Y, Z. Right. Uh, if it goes in the books as his fault, I'll just go ahead and count it as, as his fault. You know. Yeah. Um. So it, th- that's normal, by the way. I, you know, I went back and I looked and, and kind of did similar quarterbacks in similar years and things like that. And what I discovered was is that most of these uh, quote unquote elite quarterbacks are in and around the thirteen to sixteen interceptions a year range. So if Jameis is in that range, uh, you know, I get it. No interceptions acceptable. But as far as a variant, you know, like I'm not going to freak out and, and say Jameis is bad or say that he's a turnover machine or whatever, as long as he's in that range, you know. Um, so now he's he's going to be way over that range if he continues to throw two per game um, for the rest of the season. Uh, that won't be OK. But anyway, uh, I forget exactly how I got into this, but we're talking about the Dolphins B plus couple things to tweak out. I think that's what I said. Uh, so I gave the defense a D minus. Offense was B plus. Special teams. Uh, man, I had them down for a D, but I think you have convinced me to give them a full-on Florgan F. So I'm going to change my grade there because uh, I agree with you. I, every every bit about that, uh, there was, you know, I, I mean, even Brian Anger, like his punts just weren't, um, <laughs> I mean, it, it, they're fine. I didn't like your punts, Brian Anger. Yeah, they, they – Spun the wrong way. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it, I mean, there's just nothing. There's no zing to them. There's no, you know, they're they're fine. Um, and then for me, and this is probably the most uh, average grade for the team when I look at the other grades I've given them. But I too am going to give them a C. Uh, except I'm going to give them a C minus for the for the game, and that mostly because you you still lost the game and it stunk and it was it just. Bleh. Um, but uh, to me, a C is, a C is, is, is middle of the road. Like this, I would much rather see, I think I said this on the instant cast. I would much rather see a game like this than a game like what we saw at Chicago. Oh yeah. And I think any Bucks fan would like, I, I, I don't want to see losses. Absolutely do not want to see losses, but, um, you know, I want to see this team go out and compete and I want to see them grind it out and I want to see them, uh, mm-hmm you know, take it down to the wire. You know, I, I can't stand when, uh, unless we're the ones doing it, I, I can't stand when people go into victory formation, you know, at the end of a game. And and you just, you because you literally, you've locked the game up, there's nothing else you can do. Unless you're Greg Shiano, and then you, you go ahead and rush them anyway. So, 
All right, Randall. Well, that is going to do it for this episode. Folks, we will be back here in just a couple of days with our second half to tonight's episode where we're going to take a look at your emails, uh, emails from your fellow fans, and that always leads to great discussion, Ren. If you guys uh, don't come back and listen to that episode, you really ought to because uh, there's 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 so much good discussion that comes out of those emails as well. Uh, so be yeah. on the lookout for that. Uh, Ren, why don't you tell the folks out there where they can get a hold of you? On the internet. Yeah, have you noticed that everyone's talking about Quan now? Yeah. How Quan's overrated? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, we started that. Yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> and it came from an email. You know, it yep. came from an email. There's lots of things that come out of, out of those conversations that, uh, you know, because it's basically, it's like a, it's like, it's like an Algonquin table of Buck fans, you know? Sure. Except the person's not there. We start bouncing ideas off each other. What about this? What about that? So, yeah, it's it's always a, a fun episode uh, to do, at least for me. Um, you can find me on the internet. Best ways on Twitter, at Rendax, R-E-N underscore D-A-X-T. I'm always down to talk Buccaneers football. And if you guys want to get a hold of me, I am at Brent Allen Live across all the social medias. And you can find the show at The Pewter Cast on Facebook and on Twitter. Or you can send us an email to ThePewterCast at gmail.com. We take those emails all week long. So if you want to send us in something, you don't have to wait till after the game. Do it before the game. That's cool. We'll do that there. Also, iTunes reviews, all that kind of stuff, you can leave that over on iTunes. And if you want to be a part of the show, become a part of the growing community that is supporting the show, helping all the new fun things to happen, you can find out more about that at Patreon.com forward slash ThePewterCast. Well, guys, like I said, we'll be back with you here in just a couple of days. So until then, go Bucks.